talk? Does it work? Uh, hello? <laughs> ah, perfect. Okay, so audio works now. Um, so at the end, you get a 13. So this is cool, Constivalian works. Well, this is actually co called const folding, but the uh, difference is moot. So now we get to more complex stuff. Imagine you have a function, it has local variables, and it has some loops and stuff. So how do you const fold that? Like, turn that into a tree and start collapsing it? Like, this is not really possible. This is code that you walk down from the top to the bottom, and you uh, execute each instruction after each other, like you would do at runtime. But this is not possible if you try to combine things. Like, you cannot combine a y divides equals 2, because what, what are you combining there? There's, there's no two values to combine to something else. So we were trying to look, up for, uh, look at something new where we could do local variables, which are not possible in constants right now, where you can do mutation, and where we can do loops. These are the things that we want to be able to do. Like right now, you cannot do them at compile time. You, you just can do them uh, at runtime, but um, even if, the, if there's an error in this program, you won't detect it at compile time. It'll panic at runtime. So the compi Rust compiler developers decided to do it right. They uh, created the mirror, which is a, a, a structure that allows you to do the sequential um, constant evaluation instead of the folding. And then somebody wrote something called MIRI, which is the MIR interpreter, um, which allows you to evaluate MIR code. And if the MIR code contains solely constants, well, then you can just evaluate it to the end and look at the end result and then store the end result. And um, when they started doing it, they were looking at like integers and, and, and adding them and um, similar things like that. But at some point, they kind of got crazy. And then we got pointers and uh, pointer arithmetic and calling C functions and calling syscalls. And yeah, right now, we're not quite at reading files yet, but we can do print line and uh, reading from SCDN. So if you just pipe your file into the uh, SCDN, you, you can read files. Um, that's a little bit much for const evaluation, but well, we, we, we try to get there. So uh, last year, uh, I added uh, Miri to Rust-C uh, as an experiment where we were running the old const evaluator next to the new one and comparing them. So just to make sure like, we're not introducing any weird stuff that we don't want to have. Because right now, we just want to get the new uh, Miri so we can get new features in the future, but we don't want to break anybody's code. So that was running, uh, well, in December. Um, there was a big pull request at RustFest, which had like 1,600 commits. Uh, it has 7K lines of code added to the Rust compiler, which is a lot. But you have to uh, remember, this is uh, something that's essentially a virtual machine running your Rust code at compile time and producing a value that you can then compile down into your final binary. Um, the next step was, well, removing the old const evaluator, which touched another 6,000 lines of code, but it didn't add anything new. Instead, it removed all the old crap that we had in there in the old compiler. Um, and well, now it's gone. The pull request isn't merged yet, but it's running right now. Uh, the, the Rust compiler developers are merging it at the moment. It's basically already approved, just checking every single crate on crate CO whether we don't break it with the new compiler. Because, well, we don't want to break anybody's code. So let's go back to the bottom. What is MIR? MIR is called the Medium Intermediate Representation. Where, what's that? Well, it's basically an assembler, um, an assembler language. But it's very close to uh, what, how Rust um, builds your, your, your code. So you have types. Um, you don't have any registers. You have local variables. And um, it's already used for a lot of things. Like borrow checking is done completely on the MIR. So that's where we're getting nonlinear lifetimes in the future from, from MIR and borrow checking on the MIR. Uh, also, in the future, we might do, be able to do guaranteed optimizations, like tail call optimization and so on on the MIR. Like everything that's Rust um, required will be done on the MIR. Um, so MIR looks a little bit like that. It's like a big text blob that you uh, can't really read. Uh, it's essentially, uh, if, you, if you read all the small steps in there, it looks like Rust code, but there's go-tos in there, like um, a lot of go-tos. And you don't want to read code with go-tos. So instead, uh, you can convert it into a graphical representation. So this is exactly the same code. This and this is the same thing. The only difference is all the local variables declared on the top are turned into a virtual stack. And all the blocks in there with go-tos are turned into a graph with arrows between them. So you can actually read your code. And this is actually a tool that you can use to step through your, uh, uh, your constant code to check 
Like, what is it doing? How, how, what is the, the, the virtual memory of Miri doing? Well, what's going on? And, um, yeah. Um, so, Miri is a mere interpreter. So you can uh, execute all the code. It has no undefined behavior. You can do pointer arithmetics. You can do whatever you want. And if you try to do undefined behavior, the compiler will simply tell you, uh, well, you tried to do undefined behavior here. Uh, please don't do that. So um, it will give you an error message that, like, it looks like a Rust compiler error message. It just tells you, at this line of code, you're doing undefined behavior. Just stop and try again. And uh, this works for a lot of things. Like, like please try to break Miri. It's really hard. Like, the, 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 there's a few things that we, we know about. Like, you can actually mutate non-mutable variables. But that's basically by the definition. A, a, a mutable variable is just a lint telling you you are allowed to mutate it. But um, whether, like, the, the, the background uh, memory is mutable, that's completely, um, uh, you're completely allowed to modify it, actually. Uh, uh, there's no, no, nothing restricting you from modifying an uh, immutable variable. Um, so uh, I already told you, Miri, the tool, it can do a lot of stuff like re read from a uh, command line or uh, do some syscalls, uh, some easier ones. But, um, well, we don't want all of that in compiler. So what we're doing right now is we're separating Miri, the tool, and Miri, the const evaluator. And um, the const evaluator does everything you expect from a const evaluator. It, it computes uh, your, your pluses, uh, your multiplications, it calls functions, and so on, but it doesn't do print line. It doesn't do syscalls, because syscalls doing const evaluation, that's just weird. Um, but we might do it in the future, but we'll need RFCs for that, because we don't just randomly want to enable random features that maybe are bad. So, but what you can do instead with Miri the tool is, well, you have a test suite, and you're kind of getting undefined behavior somewhere, you don't know where. So you just run Kygo Miri instead of Kygo test, and it'll run all your tests with Miri through the const evaluator. So if you do any undefined behavior, it'll just stop and tell you, this test at this line of code is doing undefined behavior. And to top off on that, it'll print a stack trace. Like if you're inside libstd in the vector function push inside something whatever deep, it'll tell you a stack trace down to where you're doing undefined behavior. It's not like GDB, which, which crashes at some point when you're um, at an actual error. It, it stops you right when you're doing undefined behavior like right before it. And then you can even look at the memory and say, OK, well, how, how does it look? Well, where am I right now? And then you can find out how your code is doing undefined behavior. So this is the tool. Um, side effects of using all of this in const evaluation is you can start doing heap allocation in, in constants. Well, you can't. We disabled it. But we will be able to do that in the, f in the future. So you can do strings. You can do serial decoding of JSON files at compile time convert that into a structure, store that structure in static memory, and then you have your configuration already parsed, already checked for errors, everything at compile time in memory. You can just say, OK, well, like, what's the setting? And you get the setting. You, you, you don't need to check anything. You don't need to even have the file present. And you have like, like a big configuration file, like in JSON or XML. These might take megabytes or something. Convert them down to binaries, They're down to kilobytes or, or even less. So. You, you, you save all the, the, the computation time at compile time, you save all the memory, and uh, you even get error checking at compile time. So, um, yeah. These are the side effects. <laughs> um, there's still some things that we need to do in the future. Um, for example, there's some very complex things when people start using associated types and associated constants. Like, technically, these things are all right, but Miri will just say, uh, sorry, this is too complex for me. Uh, the old const evaluator said the same thing, so we're not losing any, uh, any features here. But the thing is, with Miri, we can actually start doing these things. Like, we can think about how are we going to do this. We, we, we have a structured way to approach this. For example, think about you have an array, and the length of the array depends on a trait implementation for this array that you don't know the length of. So you need to look at the trait implementation. But to get at the trait implementation, you need to have the type for which you need the length, for which you need the trait implementation. Yeah, you're going to end in a cycle. So, um, But maybe that value you need for the length is completely independent of the length that you need. So there's no cycle. It's, it's just some information attached to the array in general. 
And to do these things, that's called partial evaluation, because you don't know everything, but you know enough to compute the value. And this is a big thing that we're going to be working on this year. Um, but it's going to take time. And um, yeah, one other big thing that we're working on is um, allowing, ex for example, GDB to uh, run a Rust code with Miri on actual physical memory. So um, instead of uh, trying to actually execute real code, you're going to run these things on, on your actual memory, but with the Miri debugger uh, checking the code um, for things like undefined behavior and so on in your debugger. So you, you, you can run GDB and then you, you execute a small command. It got compiled, it'll get run by Miri, and it'll tell you some results that you usually could not get because this kind of complex evaluation just isn't possible in GDB. Um, also, uh, one feature that we want to have, if you compile your code and you have a constant evaluation error, well, the compiler could stop at that point and offer your debugging window telling you exactly what went wrong. Like, you, you usually get a stack trace that tells you, okay, it went wrong here and there and there and there, but you don't know any values, you don't, you don't know the mem how the memory looks, maybe you did some weird pointers things in your constants, you don't know exactly what's going on. So the next step is to allow you to call your compiler and then just stop when something goes wrong and inspect what exactly is going on. So these are the things that we are working on, but what's even better for you is you can help too. And you can write RFCs because we have a lot of features that are basically just error needs RFC format some texts about what kind of RFC we need. This is literally just to check. If something is not allowed, exp uh, report this error and below is the code that would execute if it were allowed. So the code is there. Like, we just need RFCs. You need to write a text uh, that, that explains how, to, how um, this affects other things, but you need, need to write it from a user perspective. You need, don't need to care about the implementation. The implementation is there. You just need to write how you wanted this feature to work, and we can just turn it on. So, yeah, please do that. We need RFCs, and we don't have enough people annoying the other Rust compiler or developers to uh, write, uh, actually enable the features. If the feature is required by enough people, we're probably going to get it pretty quickly. Um, yeah, uh, one other thing that you can do, you can go to the REST compiler and look through the documentation and think, this function doesn't do anything weird. It doesn't do anything that depends on runtime values, no randomization, and so on. Mm, it could be a constant function. This function could be evaluated at compile time. So all you need to do is open a uh, pull request to the REST compiler writing const in front of DFN, and you're already helping us because you found a function that we could make const. There's a pull request. You're talking with the Rust compiler developers about it, and we're going to turn it into constant, and done. It works. It, it, it's now a constant function. Um, these things are really easy to do, but somebody needs to do them, and um, we're already trying to do hard things, so it would be really cool if you, uh, you guys would help us there. And um, yeah make the Rust compiler even more awesome than it already is. Thanks. So does anybody have any questions? Yes. Can this automatic hinting about the concept, can this be automated using the linter? Um, Okay, the question is if we can automate uh, the process from finding functions that could be constant and making them uh, making these suggestions automatic. We probably can. That's a, I have no idea why uh, I've never thought about that. That's like <laughs> I'm developing Clippy like every few weeks. <laughs> but, yeah, that's that's a really good question. Uh, we should totally do that. It won't work for everything. Like it, it's really hard to detect if something is constant valuable. If it were easy we just do it automatic, and you wouldn't need to annotate anything. But um, that, that is basically the halting problem. Like sometimes to check whether a function is constant valuable, uh, you probably need infinite computation time to figure it out. So that might not quite work out. But uh, for the easy things, we can definitely do that. Yes? Uh, changing functions to const, changing declaration, would it break? Uh, the question is whether adding const to a const of n, uh, to a function, um, so making it a const of n, would be a breaking change. No, it will never be a breaking change to move from fn to const of n. That's impossible to be a breaking change by itself. 
what would be a breaking change is going the other way, from const of n to f n. Does that, this means you need to think about whether this function would ever, in the future of Rust, do something that could be not constant. For example, access random number generators or do something other, uh, like accessing the current time or so, so on. Um, if it would ever do that in the future, then you cannot turn it from fn to const fn right now. This is something that wouldn't be automatically checkable because it's just semantics of the function. Yes? Yeah, would it technically be possible to have a record with this <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I am prepared for this question because Pascal already asked me this question. So, sufficiently advanced <laughs> incremental <laughs> compilation is indistinguishable from a REPL. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the REST compiler dev, they're doing incremental compilation things. We might have heard about those. This is to speed up compilation. So instead of having to recompile for adding a small variable or anything, um, the compiler just recompiles the parts that you changed. If you get this incremental compilation good enough, at some point you won't care if there's no REPL because you'll just be re the REPL will be just a wrapper around the, the REST compiler that just adds new stuff to a file and then reruns the Rust compiler and the, 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 the const evaluation memorizes with incre incremental compilation the values from the previous compilation. So this, this will be a bash script with like three lines. Yes? Given that immutability is a default for variables, do you, do you think if Rust was started, from, started again, const from would be the default? <laughs> The question is, uh, since um, mutab immutability is the default for locals and so on, would it be um, better, like if, if Rust started anew, to make everything default constafen and then have a, a flag for making it not constafen? I personally would think that would be the correct solution. Uh, we had a, an RFC about that where there was a big discussion about it, and at some point we just realized, well, switching around would be a breaking change. Um, so, um, it, it's questionable, like, you can't really test it, like, with, with immutability and mutability, it's easy, you just look at big databases, uh, big, big code bases, and look how it's done there, but with constafen, the problem is, there's not much previous experience about that. Like, we have other languages that do best effort const evaluation, um, where, we, where you, for example, in Lisp, where you just throw random statements in there and they're going to get evaluated if they are evaluable. Um, and here we try to do it upfront by, by deciding whether it's const evaluable or not. Um, it, it's a really hard decision, and it would probably be better to do the other way around, but um, that might just lead to people randomly throwing not const on it. So. Um, Right now, we're just uh, opting for the lint option that tells you when to make it constafen, and then you're done with it.